This is Twit. British theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking died at age 76 this week. Hawking was best known for his best-selling exploration of the universe, A Brief History of Time. And he was also known, as his children put it in the announcement of his death, known for his courage, persistence, and humor. Joining us to talk about Hawking and his legacy is Dave Gershgorn. He is a reporter, an artificial intelligence reporter at Quartz. Welcome back to the show, Dave. Hi, thanks for having me. So talk a little bit about uh, Hawking's legacy in terms of science. Yeah, so Stephen Hawking has a very rich uh, legacy in uh, theoretical physics. Um, known for marrying, you know, the the largest theories about the universe with, with some of the smallest. And um, a, he, his book, A Brief History of Time, is incredibly well known. It was a New York Times bestseller for, uh, I think it was like four years. Um, so he has definitely contributed a lot to uh, science as well as pop culture. I mean, his he is known as kind of somebody who is a modern day physicist that was, uh, you know, pushing the boundaries um, in, in our time, in a, in a time that information was shared quickly and uh, it, there was an opportunity to be rebutted. It wasn't something where, um, you know, you had to, and like, it, like when papers were first coming out in, in, in physics, somebody could think about ideas for decades and have internal discussions. Everything was out there, everything was uh, was debatable. There were new technological advances, and, and a lot of what he was saying held up over time. So um, he also kind of like made splashes in pop culture, and he was a communicator of science as well as someone who um, kind of took physics to a, a new, new place. Now, in recent years, he was known for his questioning of AI, kind of coming out and saying, yes, there's a purpose, there's good to come yeah. of this, but but we also need to be wary of it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Totally. Um, so he, Stephen Hawking had like a really interesting relationship with artificial intelligence. On on one hand, he used AI every day for the most you know basic tasks, like communicating with people around him. Um, his computer had a like word prediction algorithm that would was trained on his speeches and his uh, lectures and his books and it would uh, when he would type a letter it would suggest the most likely word a lot like the the um, key keyboard on your smartphone so this is what really allowed him to type at a speed that was acceptable to him he for uh, you know a few years he was typing letter by letter and it was completely frustrating. He would hit the wrong uh, letter sometimes, have to go, like, wait for the cursor to go to the next uh, place where he could, he could backspace. Um, so this kind of, these predictive algorithms really helped him uh, and, and helped him communicate and, and kind of like make his life better every day. Um, and it's something that I think we can relate to. There are things like with Google, it's, it, they have AI in their algorithm now, and, and we use AI to make our lives better. But he kind of had a very direct relationship with it. Um, but I think since he's such a big macro thinker, um, he also saw the potential harm that AI would uh, could possibly bring to the world. I think uh, he said that it could be the best or the worst thing to, for humanity. Um, so I, I think he really cautioned against uh, letting AI free and free to kind of optimize for whatever it wanted to. Um, I, I, but I think that like a lot of the, the news headlines that wrote about Stephen Hawking after you know, reading and going through a lot of what he actually wrote himself um, kind of simplified what he thought about artificial intelligence. He really had a nuanced understanding of, of narrow artificial intelligence, which are you know, things that like the predictive algorithm that chooses the next word versus general artificial intelligence which is, um, you know, something that has a similar uh, learning capability to a human, but at a computer data center scale. Um, so I think, I mean, to be expected from someone of his intellect, but he, um, he, he really had spoken with a lot of people, it was evident, and, and read a lot of literature on it. Um, and I think that he had a, a pretty nuanced idea of, of if the AI was let loose and it was... Uh, the AI or humans, there were only so many, many resources on the earth um, and and the AI would probably want it for themselves. His voice carried a lot of weight on what 
we can expect out of a future when it when it comes to, to many things but it, obviously ai is is one big component of what he did a lot of thinking and a lot of talking about in the last hour many years you you actually uh, mentioned in your article and i read through a reddit ama uh from a few years ago hawking uh said that a recursively improvable ai an ai that basically makes itself smarter and smarter and smarter in its own operation will result in machines that are smarter than us more than we are smarter than snails that doesn't kind of put you into your own place you know but that that when i read that i was like man that's one way to put it and that's really kind of depressing but at the same time there aren't many thinkers alive now where the majority of people who hear or read you know his words put as much weight into it as we do and have through stephen hawking's work who I don't know who fills that void now. Now that he is gone, who who kind of carries that flag moving forward to say it's really important that we get responsible about how we're developing these systems? Well, I think specifically for AI, um, there have been a lot of organizations that have stepped up and started looking at the ethics um, of automated systems. Um, there is an organization against killer robots specifically, um, and that's just robots and for autonomous warfare. Um, there have been a number of uh, academic research outfits that have cropped up, like the AI Now Institute, uh, mainly at a New York University, led by, uh, uh, sorry, Meredith Whitaker, um, and uh, and I think and, and a researcher from from Microsoft, um, and they are working on doing the the social implications of AI, and it's like core research, like when AI is introduced to a system. Uh, what is that? What does that mean? How does automation change the a society? Whether it's predictive policing, whether it's um, you know the the criminal justice system, whether it's you know predicting food scarcity, something you know any anything that that an automated system can be um, kind of applied to. There's also uh, a, a bunch of companies that are starting to to look at this. You know, DeepMind has an, an ethics. Uh, group now that they published, you know, a, a blog post on um, on on bias just yesterday, and they're try trying to look at their themselves and create sort of like a, a better future. So I think that, um, and there's also the partnership on AI, which is a whole bunch of big tech companies that are come together to talk about this very topic, as well as how do we inform the public about this? How do we work together to create, you know, some sort of standard that the public can trust in an AI product? So um, I think that. While Hawking was kind of seeing the, the, the future a little bit in terms of what could be possible in 10, 20, 30 years, um, now the industry has progressed to the point where they're starting to take the reins a little bit and, and represent themselves. So um, while Hawking was definitely someone who was able to reach a lot of people, I think um, that the it, it's really now falls on the AI industry to kind of explain themselves and hold themselves or, or be or let themselves be held accountable by the public who are increasingly starting to um, in, want more answers about the algorithms in their lives. I think as with so many things, we are often afraid of the wrong thing. And I think that that is uh, true for artificial intelligence. Last week, it was the story of the, you know, Amazon Echo laughing at you. And the simple, like, technological right. answer for that was pretty basic. You know, it was very easy to say, you know, laugh and give the wake word. And people were saying it and it was laughing. Whereas we don't spend any time thinking about really what is what is the data that, that Amazon's collecting about us and, you know, what are we giving? and what is it going to be used for, that sort of thing. So I know that you regularly regularly write about artificial intelligence and there's a lot of stuff to, to sort of be scared of. But I mean, you, you know, you, you're interested, you're obviously very interested in this and you, you like it. So it, have you become more frightened about artificial intelligence as you're learning more about it um, or less frightened? And, and what are the things that you really, like you said, you know, um, algorithmic, uh, you know, inequality. I know you mentioned in your article, like the, how AI will, uh, will affect wealth distribution. What are the things that you think are important for people to really be concerned about? Yeah, there are two ways to think about it. And I think that this kind of reflects where Stephen Hawking's mind was on the issue, his, his take. It's, uh, he was a big macro thinker. He thought about, you know, if you're talking about the, the Earth as a zero-sum game, um, 
who's going to hold the resources on a you know or on a planetary level um when you but when you talk about research and when you talk about um the actual incremental improvements that people are making in artificial intelligence uh it's a lot less scary because you start to realize a lot of the shortcomings you know when you're talking about okay so this algorithm is deployed on a data center it's confined to this you know these few gpus um and there's you know nothing in its programming and there's nothing that it can learn that would cause it to go to other GPUs or another data center or, you know, kind of like escape its bounds or how it even do that to be super intelligent. Anyway, um, it becomes much less scary. Um, so I think I, I kind of fluctuate wildly on between micro and macro and whether we should be scared. I mean, and it's understandable why people are scared because it's like, you know, there, there was a book that like our final invention where it's like, I could easily be imagined as the end of humanity if it, you know, goes wrong. But um, I think that the chances of that are probably slim, but the the potential risk would be great. So um, I, I think that there are two minds that can exist simultaneously on how scared we should be of AI. Um, I think it's probably a lot more real, realistic or, you know, prevalent to, the way that the world and the industry is developing to be more scared of what humans are doing with AI rather than what AI is going to do of its own volition. Um, you know, we have, like I said, you know, it's, it's how wealth is going to be distributed, um, how structural inequalities in our society are going to be encoded into these algorithms by accident, not necessarily on purpose, um, but just things that, you know, we kind of take for granted in our, criminal justice system and, um, you know, in our economic system and just like the way that we treat others is an example for machines. So if we are, if there's hate speech online, machines are going to learn hate speech. That was like the big kind of thing with Tay, right? Microsoft's rogue AI bot. Um, artificial intelligence has this incredible ability to be a mirror to humanity. I mean, it's, it's really reflecting what we give it. So if we, it's garbage in, garbage out. Um, so I think that we need to be just really careful about what we feed these things. And um, I think that that's really what I look at most often and, and what I'm worried about and think people should be thinking about rather than, you know, whether Terminator is going to happen. So we can see it more along the lines of the plot of Gremlins, for example, then. <laughs> yeah, don't feed them after midnight. Um, no water, right? Like okay. Got it. <laughs> Dave, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure as always. Dave Gershkorn is a reporter yeah. at Quartz. You can find his work at QZ.com. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dave. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.